There are some parts of the Bible that you read and if we're honest, you find yourself saying, why on earth is this here? It doesn't seem to say anything to me in uh, 2024. It's talking about a situation that I'm unfamiliar with. Uh, why? Uh, and I think Romans 9 to 11, these three chapters that we've been looking at over the last couple of weeks and today and next week, God willing, uh, is, is like that for many of us. Uh, it might have been all right in the first century, people got it, or the 16th century when people were fighting about different issues and this really spoke to them. Um, but today, I mean, it's about Jews and Gentiles. Now, as far as I know, I could be wrong, but I don't think there are any Jews here, meaning people who are born Jews. Um, we're Gentiles. We're the, other, we're the other half, as it were. And uh, nobody here is asking, well, does my Jewishness or does the Jewishness of the Jews uh, matter at all? Uh, is there a special place for the Jews? Um, what about if you're in a Jewish family and you've become a Christian? What about my relatives? Is there something special for them? Are they advantaged by being Jews or disadvantaged by being Jews? And uh, some Christians who are not Jews uh, often, well certainly when Paul wrote Romans, was asking, were asking similar questions. Israel has had a big, big role to play in God's redemptive plan for the world. Uh, is that plan continuing? Is there still a place for Israel? Uh, a unique place. Uh, should we be seeing what's happening? This is a question many people are asking. Today, 2024, as we, look at, as we look at the land of Israel, the nation of Israel, and Gaza and the West Bank and Lebanon, I mean, these things, uh, do they have a special significance in the history of the world, in the plan of God? Now, if you're not either a convert from Judaism to Jesus, um, worried about your family members who are not yet Christians, or if you're not a person who is an Israel watcher, keen to see what's happening in the Middle East, uh, you may be thinking, uh, why are we doing this? Why are we looking at these three chapters, Romans 9, 10 and 11? Well, they tell us something really wonderful, folks, as well as answering those questions, they tell us something that's really very relevant. And I hope we'll see that today as we, as we go through. Uh, there's a picture at the centre of Romans 11, which is Suzanne just read it, you'll, if you, you got it, you, will hear, you heard, you were listening, you'll have seen the picture. It's a picture of an olive tree. And it's an olive tree in this picture, that's a bit like, is it, there's someone here, I won't name the person, who in their backyard have got what was a lemon tree. And that person has grafted in to the trunk of the lemon tree a, a, a branch from an orange tree. And you go to his house, and here's a tree with lemons and oranges on it. It's a grafted tree that's been spliced, a, a tree's been spliced with, a, with another tree. And that's the picture in, uh, in Romans 11. Israel is called the olive tree. God has cut out some of the branches of the olive tree and he's grafted into the olive tree foreign branches, what he called branches from a wild olive. It's a picture of the people of God. The root, as it were, is Abraham the root of the Jewish nation. But into this, we've got people who are foreigners, now part of the tree. And what were part of the tree, cut out. That's the picture. Now, we know from what we've already seen in Romans chapter 9, that not all Jews, people who are born in Israel, born of Jewish blood, not all Jews are true Jews. That's the distinction that Paul made back in in chapter 9, when he said in verse 6, we know that not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. Or verse 7 of chapter 9, 
not all are children of Abraham. They have Jewish blood, but they don't belong to Abraham's true family. Physically, yes. Spiritually, no. And uh, in chapter 11, we say, well, why don't they belong? Well, chapter 11, verse 20, they are broken off because of their unbelief. If they don't share the faith of Abraham, they're not children of Abraham. That's how it goes. If, they're not, if they don't have the faith of Abraham, the faith that Abraham had, then they are not children of Abraham. Um, it's, it's like um, we saw ages ago, when, one day when we were back in Romans chapter 4, that he is the father, chapter 4 verse 11, of all who believe. Not all who have Jewish blood. He's the father of all who believe. That's quite different. Okay, so here's this olive tree. There are people in it who have the faith of Abraham. Others who do not believe are cut out. Is there a place in this tree for people like you and me, Gentiles, non-Jews? Yes. Chapter 11, verse 17. You, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree. Oranges and lemons, same tree. So Paul can say, if we were to look at the, there are so many other parts of the Bible that speak about this, but that one part would be in Galatians. Uh, chapter 3, um, verse 29. If you are Christ's, you belong to Jesus, he's your, he's your leader, you follow him, then you, if you, belong to, if, you are in, if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs, inheritance, according to promise. When you belong to Jesus, whoever you are, black, blue, white, young, old, male, female, whoever you are when you belong to Jesus, you can say, I'm a child of Abraham. That's, that's clear Bible teaching. And people who do not share the faith of Abraham, though Jews, are not children of Abraham. By birth, yes. By reality, in reality, no. So can we say that the Gentiles then, people like you and me, we replace the Jews. No, we can't say that. Look at verse 23 of Romans 9, of Romans 11, I'm sorry. Verse 23. Even they, the Jews, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. But God has the power to graft them in again. Faith verifies you are part of the tree. Can Jews come in? Of course they can. They can believe in Jesus. They can turn to Jesus. As, as, as Paul himself has done. I mean, he talks about his own example, the example of himself. Um, back at the beginning of the chapter. Now, I myself, an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. Has God rejected his people? Can we fall on you? No, no. And you go back a thousand years before Paul and you come to someone like Elijah who said, oh Lord, there's nobody left in Israel. It's just me. And God said, no, hang on. I've got 7,000 people over here I've reserved for myself. And God's always had a remnant. He's always had true Jews, believing Jews, Jesus-believing Jews. He always has. And uh, at the time of Paul as well, and so Paul can say, verse 5 of chapter 11, so too, at the present time, there is a remnant, a part of the Jewish people, chosen, chosen by grace. Yes, can the Gentiles, can the Jews come back into this tree? They can, when they turn to the Lord Jesus. So it's not all black. Great unbelief amongst in Israel. It's almost a story of unbelief. But no, there was Abraham, there were 7,000 at the time of Elijah, there's Paul and there are others. There's a remnant 
chosen by grace, he says. Well, that's, all, that's the past, as it were, and the present. What about the future? Here's the question. Is there a special future for people who are Jews? Should we expect there to be mass conversions among Jews? Are we, should we expect Israel to sort of do a wholesale turning around at some stage and embrace Jesus? Well, it sounds like it. It does sound like it. Verse 25. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of all the Gentiles has come in, and in this way all Israel will be saved. Well, it sounds like there's something really big coming for the Jews, doesn't it? Verse 28. As regards election, they, the Jews, are beloved for the sake of their forefathers, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Or verse 31. God has consigned all to disobedience, that he may have mercy on all. So, I'm sure you didn't come to church this morning thinking, now, I wonder what the future is for Israel. <laughs> but let me, what are we going to do with all this? Should we actually rethink and say, yeah, we ought to expect something really big and wonderful to be coming uh, for the Jews? Well, there are plenty of good and wise people who believe that and believe that's what the Bible teaches, and they teach that. And uh, they believe it with a passion. And uh, often, not always, but often, they therefore look and say, now what's happening in Israel, the land of Israel today, is very important. It's significant. Um, it was significant when the, the modern state of Israel was founded in 1948. It was significant in 1967 after the Six Day War and Israel got a lot of its territory back. Um, it's significant since October the 7th, uh, 2023, when uh, Hamas came and invaded uh, parts of Israel, the land of Israel, and the war that's been going on since. Yeah, this is all sig very, this is extra significant. And God's over all the world, we know that. But this here has a this is something very special, has a special role in his plan for the world. That's what, that's what some people say. It's about the nation of Israel and about physical Jews and we ought to expect a mass conversion and we're waiting for it. There's a second group that say, no, no, these chapters, 9 to 11, are not about the nation so much, but they're about election, that God has his elect, his chosen people, within the nation, so that just as he has the Gentiles he has chosen and they'll come in, so there'll be Jews who are elect who will come in. Now, of course, that's true. <laughs> There's no question that's true. But I don't think that's what the passage is saying. I think it's saying something different, as true as that is. And there's a third way to read these verses. And when Paul speaks about, thinks about the future, and he thinks about Israel, he's not thinking about physical or biological Jews. He's thinking about the people of God. He's thinking about believers in the Lord Jesus, people from every nation and tribe and language group. He's speaking about Abraham's offspring by faith. He's saying, I believe, we are the Israel of God when we belong to the Lord Jesus. We're the Israel of God. We are the people of God. And uh, for his purposes of redemption, the time when Israel had a special place in that plan of redemption is finished. The Messiah came from the land, uh, from the nation, born in the land. The Messiah has established his kingdom. Now, the, the kingdom of God, the family of God, includes all who belong to the Lord Jesus equally. And we are the Israel of God. Now, if that's what these verses are meaning, and I, I think they are, I think it is, then I think that will help us understand verse 25 and 26 a, a little more clearly. Now, you may not find this all that scintillating. Some people here are waiting for the answer and waiting for a comment and they're thinking about it pretty carefully. Hang in and see where we go. Uh, let, let's put the first slide up, thanks, Lockie. 
People say that people who hold this, this, one of these other views that I've talked about, they say what, what we've got in verse 25 and 26, partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in and then all Israel will be saved. Maybe before the second coming or after the second coming, they might dip on that. But that's, that's a common way to read the verse. I think there's a much better way to read the verse. Let me put the second one up. Thanks a lot. I think it reads like this. The full number of the Gentiles come in, and in this manner, or the ESV has, in this way, all Israel will be saved. The full number of the Gentiles come in, joined to Abraham and David and the other godly, godly Jews. And in this way, as we all come in, so the Israel of God is saved. And then uh, Christ returns to wind up the world. Uh, this is how it happens, says Paul. Sure, we know that so many Jews belong to the Lord by faith, like Abraham, but the full number of the Gentiles is coming in, and what this means is that all of Israel is saved. Thanks, Lockie. Now, as I say, you may not have found that all that scintillating, I think. But it's important. Um, it was certainly important for Paul, who is the apostle to the Gentiles, if regarded as a traitor by many Jews, when he goes to the Gentiles. But no, he says, because the Israel of God is bigger than the blood in your veins. Much bigger. Well, if you've mentally checked out over the last 10 or so minutes, can I recapture you as I talk about two things that this means? Uh, means in every age, uh, whether you're a Jew or you're not a Jew, this is really, really significant. And the first thing to say is that God has only one way. God has only one way. What Paul has been saying in chapters 9 and 10 so far, as we've looked at the last couple of weeks, is that being a Jew doesn't decide anything. You can be a true blue Jew and it doesn't give you any advantage over those who are not Jews apart from the things that you've had in your history, which is a great advantage. The covenant, the law, the temple, the prophets. He already said that back in chapter 9. We know that you can be a true Jew and be outside the family of God. That was true back in chapter 9, when Paul said, consider the, t the twin grandsons of Abraham. Now, you can't get a more level playing field than twins. Same parents, same grandparents, same, same, uh, same all the, 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 the things that feed into making that person what it is. It's all in common. But God said, back in chapter 9, but Jacob, one of the twins, I've loved. Esau, the other, I've hated. There's an election, there's a choice going on between the very grandsons of Abraham. Some Jews do not belong in the tree because of God's sovereign choice. And then there are those from the wild olive tree, as I've said this morning, that's you and me, we belong to the Lord Jesus, we've been put in. So we were disadvantaged, ultimately, because we were not born Jews, and the people who were born Jews weren't advantaged, ultimately, because they were part of the tree. It's not like that. You can be taken out, you can be placed in. So if we ask the question, are the Jews, by virtue of being Jews, in the family of God? No. Are Gentiles, who are not born Jews, entitled to be in the family of God? Is that a possibility? Yes. And what was the basis we saw last week? If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, it's irrelevant. It's all to do with what you do with Jesus. 
It's always been like that. And he goes on, he went on and said in chapter 10 last week, and everyone who believes in the name of the Lord, which Lord? The Lord Jesus, will be saved. Everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. Verse chapter 10, 13, chapter 10, verse 11. You know, it's never been race that puts you in the family of God. It never has been. It's never been race, it's always been grace. It's always been electing grace that changes you and calls you to faith. It's always been grace. It's never been race. And it was like that in the Old Testament. You know, there's a tighter connection between the Old Testament and the New Testament than you might think. You know, there's a, I, hear, I sometimes hear people say, well, in the Old Testament, people... People were forgiven by virtue of being Jews, or they were forgiven by virtue of doing the right thing. No, they weren't. They were forgiven because by virtue of faith, which was an outworking of grace. And in the New Testament, how are people made part of the family of God? Because they're chosen in, in grace, and the outworking of that is faith. It's the same. There's not this sort of this, this uh, great division between Old and New Testaments that people sometimes imagine. So what kind of heritage do you think you need to be part of the children of God, to be a child of God? What kind of record? What do you need to be able to come to God and say, well, look, God, look, I've got, I've got these credentials here. But then I'm not interested. The Jews had all the credentials. No, they were so worthless in the end. Because they were not met with faith in the, in the, in the Lord's salvation. No point saying, well, I've got these connections. I've got this sort of blood in my veins. God says, I'm not interested. It's ne- Look, if you want a level playing field, this is it. Those things have never mattered. I, I, I for one, and I'm not the only one here, I know that, but I, for one, am so grateful for that. Um, when I came to the Lord Jesus at the age of 11, there was nobody in my family as far as I know, who trusted Jesus. Nobody. They weren't even Christians. Even going back generations, I couldn't see it. You see, God doesn't work on the basis of generations or family connections. It's never been like that. I had nothing that I could present to God as a reason for him to accept me. In fact, uh, quite the opposite. Now, that's not the same as saying or asking. Would I have been blessed had I had Christian parents? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> it's about the best blessing God can give you, anybody, to give them Christian parents. Would I have been blessed if I'd been raised in a, in a really strong and sound church? Absolutely. <laughs> that's another great blessing. But they weren't decisive any more than the, 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 the kind of uh, the racial blood in the veins of the Jews who reject Jesus. It's irrelevant. God has only one way into his family. And we saw it last week at the end of chapter 10. God said, look, see my open arms? Jesus says, anybody thirsty? Come and drink. Come and drink. Anybody weighed down? Come to me. I'll ease your, ease your load. Anybody want life? It's in me. Come. And there are these open arms of, of the Lord Jesus to all. The offer to all. Anyone who will come. And we saw at the end of um, chapter 10, God says, All day long I've held at my hands. But they said, No. Well, that's always been the way. Open arms, the way of mercy, the way of grace. It's always been like that. For Abraham, for Moses, for David, for Paul, for me. That's the way it's always been. There's only one way in. It's the way of grace working out in faith. Only one rule, one say. So God has only one way. And secondly, that's the two points. 
God has only one people. If you looked at this grafted tree, and there are Jews in there, and there are Gentiles in there, how many trees? How many trees? Just one. How many futures? How many plans? Is there a plan for the Jewish side of the tree and a different plan for the Gentile side of the tree? No. One tree, one family, one plan. And God hasn't, God's not running sort of parallel plans through this world, the Jews here and the rest of us over here. It's not like that. Not two nations, not two futures, just one. And folks, that's why if you, that's why any division between the people of God that's based on race or wealth or age or anything is destructive. Not any difference, there are differences between the people of God. And if you're born a Jew, you're still born a Jew, no matter how much you believe in the Lord Jesus. And you'll look and sound like a Jew, in the same way as if you were born uh, in Colombia or Brazil or Sweden. You'll still look and sound like that's what you are. Now, there are differences, but God has put together two things to make one undivided. Differences, yes. Division, no. And, and I think part of the reason why Paul is writing all this in Romans 9, 10 and 11 because there was a problem in the church at Rome. And the people who were Jews before, by birth, Jews by birth, they were sort of uh, trying to say, well, you Gentiles ought to sort of get on, get on our page. You ought to sort of do and say and, and enjoy the things that we do and say and enjoy. And the people who were the Gentile converts Look at the Jews as though they were the losers. Look at your, 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 your people have turned away from Jesus en masse. And uh, what you've had in the past didn't help you one scrap. You're, you're lesser than us. And uh, so there was this division in the church in Rome. And that's why uh, Paul could say later in, uh, well, in this chapter, he says, yeah, don't be arrogant. If you're in the tree as a Gentile, don't be arrogant about the, about the Jews. That's why in chapters 14 and 15 of Romans, he can talk, talk to them and urge them to pursue peace and what makes for, what makes for, pursue what makes for peace and for, for mutual upbuilding, he says, in chapter 14, verse 19. Friends, this, this is so important. Look, if, if you said, what is God's plan for this world? Well, it's got a million, part, a billion parts to it. But the centre of the plan, God's plan for this world, is to remake one out of two. So you read, you read Ephesians chapter 2, and it talks about the coming of the Lord Jesus. And it said, his purpose in coming was to make out of the two, Jew and Gentile, one man. And the moment that we start to say, well, there are two futures that are different, and there are two peoples, and there are two plans, we're, we're, we're saying, what Paul said in Ephesians 2, that can't be right. And his whole purpose was to make one. And that's what God's doing in this world. In a broken world, he's making his church. He's building his church as one, united, not divided, with all its differences, but one. It's only ever been one people. Only ever. So, friends, don't divide what God's doing together. Do you see why the Bible places so much emphasis upon unity in churches? Not sameness, but unity. Because this is a demonstration of the mighty working of God that he brings together people who were always divided. Run, run a checklist on yourself as I, as I finish off. If I ask you... Do you look down on other Christians who don't have the sort of background you've got or can't boast about the things you can boast about or don't know what you know or conversely, do you rate yourself as inferior because you haven't got those things? 
It's a level playing field. Chosen by grace, electing grace, brought to faith in Jesus as the outworking of that grace. Who's inferior? Who's superior in the church of Jesus? Do you work hard to embrace other Christians who are a bit different from you? Do you go out of your way to say, we're in the same family? Or are you happy just to say, well, they're so different, I'll leave them over there and I'll be over here? Do you prize what it means to be one people so that you give our top priority to being together with the one people that's at the centre of God's plan for the universe? Or are you more conscientious about going to work tomorrow than you are about coming to church on Sunday? That wouldn't make sense, would it? How could that be? Do you work hard to remember that Christians who get under your skin have been loved and chosen and brought to Jesus in sweet and sovereign grace, just as much as you have. That changes things, doesn't it? There's a lot about forgiveness. There's a lot about bearing with people. There's a lot about hanging in with people. Do you rejoice? Really rejoice in a way that rises above the sadness of a broken world. There's plenty of sadness in this world. But in the certainty that Jesus is remaking, he's remaking everything, bringing people together, different people, people who previously were enemies, divided, bringing them together into one in a way that nothing can spoil or destroy. And the last check would be. Are you looking forward to that day? It's almost here. It's almost here. When those who've been ransomed by Jesus from every tribe, every language group, every nation, every people, Revelation 5 9, shall sing together in praise for the Lamb. And even the differences will be a delight, and there'll be no division. It's a great plan. God has only one way and only one people. So whatever, whatever we make of these verses in Romans, <coughs> Romans 9, 10 and 11, let's not take away from that just even for a second. Only one way, ever. That's why we speak about the exclusive Jesus. If you don't know Jesus, you don't know God. The only way. And only one people. And God means it to show. And what a privilege for us to be part of that and to show it where we are. It's a big deal. It's a really big deal. So let's pray. <coughs> Father, we thank you for those words that are written in by Paul and Ephesians, that Christ has come to break down the dividing wall of hostility and make in himself one new man, creating one man out of the two. We we'll thank you for the olive tree. It says that we are joined together, Jew, Gentile, person who has a foul record, person who has a spotless record, joined together with Abraham at the root and Jesus at the one who does, who ties the tree together, who makes the new tree. Lord, we thank you for the blessings that we have in the Lord Jesus. Give us grace, we pray. Even though our questions are not about Jews and their future, perhaps, but so to rejoice in the work of the Lord Jesus, so to rejoice in his salvation, so to come to open arms, we find that we are bound together with all those who belong to the Lord Jesus in the most wonderful and eternal way, we pray. And give us grace to show that to a watching world, we ask, that people might turn and believe in the Lord Jesus, we pray. And we ask in his name. Amen.